So I'm interested, you know, you've got this big team that you're managing, huge organization. How do you find the time? Where do you focus your attention so you're producing the results that you need to? I, I'm a firm believer that uh, everyone in the company, especially the leaders, need to be able to define their jobs in two sentences. Because if you come out to me and say, I've got a whole page of job scope, what finance does or what actuarial does or what marketing does or HR does, I think it's very boring. Nobody's interested in what you're doing. Yeah. So people come to me, I tell them, you must understand what my job is. So I tell them, I am the conductor of the opera, of the orchestra. Right? And my job is not to play any of the instruments. I don't know how to play any of the instruments. I get the best people to play the instruments. And my job is to make sure that they actually get better at what they're doing. But it's my job to coordinate everything such that all the sounds that they are making are converted into a beautiful song rather than just noise. Mm. Yeah, so I, my job is to bring everything together. But people know that and I'm not supposed to be doing anything myself. So I, I, I came from the actual department. The first day I was appointed as CEO, the chief actually looked very nervous. And I said, if I wanted to be the chief actually, I wouldn't have accepted the CEO position. So that job is yours and you, you make all the calls. Yeah. So I think if everyone can define their jobs, then I think the alignment, uh, the teamwork uh, becomes, you can take it to another level. Mm. So you mentioned alignment, which is interesting. So you have this vision as the CEO and your team are absolutely vital to implement that. So how do you align that team so everybody's pushing in the same direction? I think it is surprising as to how many companies never find the time to have a clear roadmap, mm -hmm. a clear target, whether you call it a vision, right, or a target or a goal. And then they never come together to put together a strategy to get to that goal. Now, so whilst we sit here and say, how can that be the case? And I tell you, when I took on my first job, all I knew was I had to hit the sales and profits for the first three months. So I just continued what they were doing. Right? But after the first three months, I had to hit the sales and profit for the next three months. And then if it's doing reasonably well, then you must be a brave man to change the strategy. So I think there are a lot of CEOs who are caught so caught up in the day-to-day -day work that they actually never have the time to change path, to change strategy. And then hence they continue, you can be there for 10 years and you can still continue down the path, which was actually somebody else's strategy. And it doesn't mean that you got to change it for the sake of change. But sometimes if it's not yours, you can't give it 100%. You can only probably give it 90% and just take it forward. You cannot achieve excellence unless it is absolutely your strategy. It's in your goal, I think. You've talked a lot about alignment. Can you give us an example where you've gone into a company, it's completely out of alignment in some area, and what you did to bring that back into alignment? So when I first became CEO in the Philippines, I said I had some sleepless nights. And the reason for the sleepless nights was because I felt very uncomfortable to be the CEO of that company because that company was producing products which actually was very poor value for the man in the street. So we were making a lot of money out of it, but I felt extremely uncomfortable as to how could I continue to rely on a product where the consumers absolutely had a, as a horrible deal for the consumers. So, then I started to look at it to say, shareholders win, customers don't win, and how long is this going to continue? Right? And then I started to think of alignment, and in my mind, I came up with a car. And I said to the car, if I want this car to go for a long distance and at reasonable speed, which is like a company which is sustainable profits and continues to succeed, then what do I need in that car? And I looked at the wheels and I said, I need four wheels which need to be aligned in the direction in which they are rolling 
and they need it to be the same size. And then you'd ask me, how does that car link back to the company? Because the four wheels are the key stakeholders in the company. So it is the distributors, the customers, the, stakeholders, the shareholders, and the employees. I could add a fifth wheel in the regulators, but to keep it simple, the, these were the four wheels. So I actually started to look at a product where I, I asked the company, is there, where is the most of the wealth in the Philippines? And they said, if you sell, it's all with the Filipino Chinese. They've got a lot of money, but if you come up with the product, if the current product where there were a lot of charges up front, absolutely no chance of them buying it. So then I said, okay, this is a great opportunity to align things because the money is there. So the shareholders should be happy that we'll be able to grow sales. And we came up with a product with the most competitive charges in the market. Our profit margins were slashed, but our sales were much higher. The consumers were genuinely getting a good deal. The shareholders were making money. And for us as staff, we felt good about it, that we weren't actually squeezing out money the hard-earned savings of people of man in the street. So I think that was, to me, that was one of my best examples of alignment where I got all the stakeholders to benefit and then we were aligned. We could have run that product for probably years to come. Mm -hmm. So how important do you think creating uh, a better product for the end customer is in that example? Did it completely take you from being a commodity to you know, producing more value in that market? I think there's always you lose something before you win something. So you will always hear people saying we must treat the consumers as God. But a lot of times we don't because we are smarter than the consumer. Mm. Right. So we can create products which seem to be great value for the consumer, but they aren't. Now, if you want to do something for the consumers, you're sharing the profits with the shareholders we're getting with the consumers effectively if you're in improving the value for the consumers. Now, how easy is that to do when you are a listed company? Because all your bosses are asking you for more money. They also tell you, yes, you must look after the consumer. Mm. So I think it's a very fine balance. But if you didn't do that, as I said, that car will run at a very fast speed for, for some distance, but then it's going to come to a screeching halt. So you always have to balance the consumers. And I think the newer generation, which I'd say now, they actually want purpose. When they come to work, they don't come for the money. And if they can't see the purpose in the way you are treating the consumer, you are less likely to get some of the best people to work for you. Mm.